Welcome everyone who is joining the, I think it's the second of the SHP webinar series. And as you're entering into the room, it would be great if you could introduce yourself in the chat, let us know where you're joining from and what your line of work is in working with medicinal plants. So wait just one more moment and then I'll get started. So again, welcome. Thanks everyone who's joining. As I mentioned, this is the second in this, this series um, of SHP webinars. And this one is jointly hosted with the Botanical Adulterants Prevention Program. And it's my real honor to be here with Michael Heinrich and hopefully Anthony Booker, who's having a little bit of technical trouble getting on. And we'll be speaking with today about sourcing botanicals and quality control. And the next webinar we have will be on December 2nd. And like this one, it's also kind of a combination of ethnobotany and more toolkit sustainability issues. And this will be a conversation about a partnership with Dutjan Sandalwood, which is an Aboriginal cooperation, corporation sorry, in Australia, and their partnership with a sandalwood plantation. And we'll have information about the time for that soon. And all of these webinars are made possible with the generous support of SHP underwriters and donors. And you can find all this information about these companies and who they are and find out more on their websites, but this is on the SHP website. And it's also made possible through the members of American Botanical Council. And you can find out more information on the American Botanical Council at herbalgram.org. And you can also find out how to be a member yourself if you aren't already. And I also wanted to give a shout out for American Botanical Council, which is celebrating 33 years. And I love this quotation by Lauren Israelson. He said, having worked with Mark very closely from before ABC's founding, I can say that an awful lot of things that could have gone wrong for the botanical industry didn't because of Mark's skillful handling of many a bad news story that got corrected. And, and he, I won't read it all, but then of course there's Herbalgram, which remains one of the few print publications that I read literally cover to cover. And Lauren also added in his message announcing, celebrating the 33 years that he gave Mark an A plus and maybe a reprimand for talking in between, for talking while class was going on. But in any case, I want to, I'll stop sharing that for now, and we'll turn to today's webinar conversation, and I'm very happy to see um, Tony is here as well. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing um, with bios for Michael and Tony. You can read all of that on the ABC and SHP website. Michael Heinrich is a professor of ethnopharmacology and medicinal plant research at the UCL School of Pharmacy. And Anthony Booker is a senior lecturer in Chinese herbal medicine and medicinal plant science at the University of Westminster and research associate at UCL. And I'm gonna jump in because it's such a rich topic, the work you all are doing around researching into the how plants, medicinal plants are sourced and the quality. And so maybe start with you, Tony, if you could talk a little bit about your research and what led you to do that and what you found? Hi there. Hi, welcome. Um, so I, I guess my research uh, f first started when I, when I did a, uh, an MSc at uh, UCL, uh, which was just over 10 years ago now. Um, and that was um, looking at soil palmetto uh, uh, products. Uh, but then that led on to um, a PhD uh, where I was looking at uh, turmeric, accumulonga. Um, and this involved um, some of my background 
uh, training, which was in uh, analytical chemistry, but also moved me into more uh, ethnobotanical, ethnographic type uh, methods. So I went to India uh, and spent uh, about five months in India looking at different supply chains. Uh, mainly I was looking at the differences between vertically integrated supply chains and the traditional supply chains where the turmeric was taken to auction. And I was um, one seeing if I could find any benefits to the uh, to the livelihoods of the producers, and two, I was looking to see if there was any difference in the in the chemical quality. So I was using the um, uh, a model based on uh, the model used by Pucker Herbs to produce their turmeric, where they make contracts directly with farmers, so they keep the supply chain a lot shorter. Um, uh, and, and comparing this against when, when the turmeric was just sold at the highest price at auction. Um, so that's how the, the kind of research all first started. And then that just led into more kind of postdoctoral research, mainly again, looking at uh, quality of food supplements and, and, and herbal medicines. Michael, do you want to chime in now? Or, 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 uh, no, I'll do it right away. No, well, I think just to start where um, Tony finished with the um, his PhD and his research, I think what we need to add, it was a, he, Tony won a competitive PhD studentship and it was funded by the British Leverhome Trust. So um, we got some funding to do exactly this as part of a somewhat larger project um, where basically we tried to integrate agricultural science and medical sciences. My own background, my very first degree is actually a Master of Arts um, from Michigan, Wayne State University in anthropology. So um, not quite the natural sciences degree um, one would expect, but I think that informs a lot my thinking. I then did a PhD on traditional plant usage in the lowland of Mexico in an indigenous community. And it has been an absolutely, well, transformative experience certainly, but also a huge challenge um, for many reasons. Um, and I think many of the themes and many of the challenges are following me until today social injustice, cultural dominance by um, certain groups within um, the society, um, to access to healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. And that led to a whole series of research on bioactive natural products, pharmacology, phytochemistry. And when I moved to London about 20 odd years ago, we sort of moved more and more into quality control. And these things then sort of rather naturally merged into what we are talking about here, the value chain part and the quality um, assurance part. Um, we've done many of these projects in the meantime. So Tony was the first and certainly the um, icebreaker or whatever we want to call him. But um, we um, really got a lot of understanding there. And I think what really makes the big difference in both his and my thinking about this um, in terms of research is that it's not just the industrial idea how to optimize a value chain and the quality and cheap sourcing, but it's very much about sustainability, benefits to the local communities, sustainability also in terms of the current changes, not only climate changes, but I think simply um, poverty driven changes, obviously everything interlinked. So that um, has informed um, this type of research. Thanks. And what I find so interesting about your research is that it's making that connection between investing in the value, sourcing the network, you know, supplier communities and the finished product and the quality. And I wonder, I'm not sure whom of you wants to respond to talk a bit about what you found. Maybe Tony, if you could talk some about what you found around turmeric and the differences. Um, yeah, well, I think this is, this is one of the surprising things uh, that, that, that I found. And you know, one thing that, that I found is if you want to know about the supply chain and know about the quality of a herb, especially one that's coming in um, from, a, from a different country, it's really essential that you actually go there. You know, you can do as much reading around and, and, and literature reviews and, and research at home as you want, but you never ever get the, the full picture. So when I went to 
uh, India and saw the, the, the turmeric production. You know, I had no idea that um, when turmeric was harvested, if the uh, price wasn't right, um, that it wouldn't be sold, it would be stored. And sometimes it would be stored for, for two or three years until the price went up. And the storage conditions were obviously weren't always that great. And you, in order to keep it, you need to use things like pesticides and, and, and fungicides in order to you know, stop it, um, keep it in some kind of uh, saleable state. Um, but, but all the time you're storing it, the, the actual ingredients, especially the volatile ingredients, are, are, are gradually uh, disappearing. And um, although turmeric was a, the, model, the, the, the herb we looked at, this must apply to, to many different herbs that are sold in this way, because the price goes up and everyone thinks, well, uh, let, let's plant this because we can make a really good profit. And then the next year, it's been overplanted and there's a, a surplus. And so the, the, the auction price goes down and that's everyone stores it. So what, what I realized, you know, when you buy something you know, on the market and it's got an expiry date, that, doesn't necessarily, that expiry date doesn't necessarily take into account the two or three years it's been sitting somewhere, uh, somewhere in India. So that was one of the, the big shocks that, uh, that I had. And, uh, and then conversely, when, when, we, when we actually looked at the products that had the very short supply chain that, that weren't sold at auction, where the, where, where the direct contracts were made, it was um, a, you know, a very rewarding part of the, the PhD to actually be able to find um, chemical components that were absent in all of the other turmeric samples. And these were mainly the, the most volatile uh, compounds, uh, the main one being tumorone, um, which again has, has been shown to have anti-inflammatory action. So it was a, able to show that, you know, in theory, some of the uh, beneficial effects of turmeric um, are lost it, uh, after, after storage. And if you can keep the supply chain short, um, you, you, you can preserve some of these volatile components and, and they actually get through uh, in, in, into your product. So I think that was um, uh, you know, one of the, probably two of the main uh, sort of take home uh, messages that, that, that I got from, from doing field work in, in India. And I think to add maybe to what you just said, Tony, for me, they're really, key take home message of many of these studies. Let's take um, St. John's, where there's a more recent one. Also um, Red Sage, Salvia Miltiariza. <laughs> Lots of people have always argued it's all about ideal growing conditions and you know, herbalists are very proud about how they're growing their plants and processing it. The big challenge is actually very often not the primary material, but how it's processed, stored, or maybe not properly stored afterwards. And that's where all the quality problems are introduced. So I think we need a very different approach to the whole um, concept, what we need to um, focus on here. We need to focus on how is this compound going through the value chain? What are the benefits um, going um, sort of downstream, but also what are the quality um, issues which are resulting from it? I want to just interject with a, a question that was um, Michael Levin asked in the chat, which is about quality and wondering, you know, the FDA defines quality in CG, C and GMP regulations in a particular way, which is different from other definitions. And I wondered how you both, he wonders, and I also wonder how you both define quality in this work. I think it's, it's a problematic one and you need some sort of um, regulatory or um, standardized system to do it. Very often we have used the European Pharmacopoeia or the USP equally. Um, and normally for the products we have worked with, there were existing quality standards we could use in terms of um, basically the quality control. The most recent one we did, which is currently unpublished, is an MRS thesis where we looked at chrysanthemum flowers and we simply relied on the standards provided by the relevant body in China what defines chrysanthemum 
as um, a product. So one of the points is we are not necessarily arguing, um, even though we are arguing it complies, let's say with the pharmacopoeia to take the St. John's word example. Yes, it does comply or no, it does. But what we are most interesting is actually not the question, does it comply or not, but how variable is it? What's happening with the material? How is it changing? How are these things modified in both a negative way, but also in a positive way? And we are not there to say, um, this is intrinsically bad or intrinsically good. We are there to help both in an academic context, but also in an industrial context to understand people how to do it in such a way that yes, it is a, an adequate or very good quality. Mm. Yeah, and and I think another <clears throat> another measure we 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 we've used um, is to look at it at quality in a very in a, in a very basic way, and we've used just um, UK trading standards laws, which just say you know a product should be uh, fit for purpose and be what it actually says on the label, and that applies not just to herbs to any product that you buy anywhere in the UK and probably exists in many other countries. And so that with many of our studies, we've just looked at the label and, and seen what the manufacturer claims is in there. And then we've just tested against that to see if that's actually true. And in something like 25 up to 40%, we've, we've found that's not been the case, either that it's been a different species or there's been um, ingredients that haven't been declared or in extreme cases, there's been additions of uh, cheap substitutes such as rutin uh, to boost the, the flavonoid uh, content to uh, circumnavigate uh, laboratory tests. We've found in Hypericum St. John's work products, they've had uh, addition of artificial dyes, in, again, in order to um, uh, buy a part or help uh, full analysts who are using the United States Pharmacopeia to, uh, to do their tests because a lot of these dyes absorb in the same at the same wavelength. So it makes it look as if you've got more um, hypericin, hypericum compounds than, than you've actually got. So there's people that are actually going out to fool the, 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 the analyst. Um, and then in some cases we've found that there's no actual herbal ingredient at all. Um, in, in two different products, I think Ginkgo and Rhodiola that were sold on the UK market, we found that they just contained 5-hydroxytryptophan, um, which is a mild uh, antidepressant, uh, or is, is, is said to have mild antidepressant type effects. So the, someone taking it might, might feel that it's doing them some good, but in fact, that there's no actual herb in there at, at all. So on that very basic level, you know, I think that's where we need to start. You know, is this actually what you're claiming that it is? And it, once you've got past that, then we can start to look at, at other things like what you know, what are the level of adulterants, what are the level of contaminants, what are the level of active ingredients. So I think you need to start at uh, that first level and then, and then build up from there. Were you surprised by those numbers? Yeah. Yes, I think we were, yeah. Um, in the, in... I think there's a definite pattern. Um, I've, I think I would disagree with Tony that I was surprised, but um, I was in a negative way shocked that I wasn't wrong. Um, so um, I think we've seen too many cases which are highly problematic. And obviously we also have to be very clear, certain markets are more problematic than others. And um, one of the big arguments both of us have been putting forward is really about um, regulation, that you need some sort of self-regulation of the industry, which is properly enforced, or you need an, a regulation by a competent authority, which um, enables um, a very robust um, quality control of, of products. And unfortunately, that's the big challenge. So it's not really about um, what somebody asked in the chat, how many can we actually show are sort of on purpose adulterated? Because I think one of the big challenges we see in the sector is simply a lack of understanding. 
this idea, I can just get something and um, put it in my product and it's somehow going to work. So I think the educational element is something that is very important here. And that's what I like about the um, whole webinar series and the activity of the adult run program, et cetera. I think it plays such a crucial role in pushing for such an understanding. Johnny, were you gonna add on to that? I, I'm curious, so yeah. your thoughts from, because also from your research in India, comparing the different value chains, what more specific ideas about what the industry can learn beyond sort of regulation, which can be a challenging path to go. Um, I think at, at the end of most of the papers that, that we that we write about this, we we put it, it's 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 okay testing, doing you know lots of different testing and testing for different um, adulterants and correct species. Um, <clears throat> but even, even when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for, for many years and, and did I did quality assurance there, um, I always knew that, that this only ever gives you a snapshot in time. It's, it, it's just giving you an indication of what the market's like out there. And if, if you it, and often if you test for heavy metals in a product for uh, you know, five or six years, and you find that there's no heavy metals, then you can make an argument for you know why are we bothering testing for heavy metals? You know, we don't we don't need to. So, um, but the other side the the other side of that, if you keep finding problems in in um, a pro products that you're testing, um, the actual testing won't actually solve those problems. Um, all they will do is, you know, they highlight that there's a that there's a problem there, and, and what often happens is the the problem may go away for for a short period of time, and then it reappears again. And so, what we often argue is only by um, good governance and, and controlling the supply chain from uh, the very beginning, from the cultivation, the planting and cultivation stage all the way through to the end product. That's the only way you can uh, really control the, the quality. And then we, we have to do something about one, the, 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 there's essentially two problems. There's, there's one poor understanding of processes. So people not understanding where different either chemical or microbial uh, contaminants may come into their product and that may be just a case of need better education better training better facilities um, all the way through the supply where everyone is keen to improve so that's one side and then the other side is 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 part of what we've already hi highlighted where where this deliberate adulteration in order to increase profits is going on so there's almost like two very um, you know separate uh, problems going on and um, probably they, they both need tackling in, in, in different ways. And yeah, to add, I think the important point is um, also sort of following a little bit the chat. It's certainly not for us to sort of come up with final and definite quality standards and to say that's how you have to do it. Um, our project is in the end an academic. The, the key outcome of the project, brutally speaking, was Tony's PhD. That was really um, the, the overarching goal. But in academic terms, the important thing we can do is we can develop a framework which others can implement um, in practical terms. It's a task of industry and regulators to translate these findings into some sort of practice. And the, again, the, the big challenge we find is the idea of sort of endpoint control is just insufficient. You need to really have an understanding of your value chain. And I really want to go a little bit away from the quality issue because there's much more to it. The quality and, and Tony's PhD is a, is a wonderful and horrible example for this. It depends on what people need to decide based on their livelihoods. Can I afford to sell this product today or is the price too low? So I think we really need to think about all the mechanisms behind this and how we can enable people to have um, a more sustainable 
way of producing these um, primary materials. Do you all have more thoughts on, yeah, so really connecting the, that the quality is connected with the investments made in the livelihoods of those who are doing the work. Yeah, yeah, and I think that ties into to making a good quality product. I mean, and, and, and again, that goes back to when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. We people knew that if um, if a, if if um, there were problems in the in the company or a company was uh, about to be taken over or about to close down, then the quality problems would really start to go up. And, and, and I think that happens across the board. Um, whereas if you've got people that are a company that's um, doing well and, ev and everyone's committed and everyone's working together, you've got mu a much better um, chance of controlling, controlling the quality. And I think that's what some of these companies uh, have managed to do. They've managed to um, create an environment um, where everyone is working together, not only to um, produce a good end product, but also to help people's livelihoods along the way, to help sustainability, to look at all, all the different issues of um, producing herbal medicines. And I think that's probably a, a good model to, to follow. I'm interested in draw, drawing that out a little more. And so with the botanical industry, because I've been on a lot of these conversations and people talk about, yes, you know, relationships and connecting to the source. And yet it seems quite challenging for that actually to happen, except in a few exceptions. And I wonder if your research in this or other areas has given you insight or thoughts about the challenges in the botanical industry, that, that sort of the blocks that keep, make it hard to implement these one of, the key issues, yeah, one of the key issues I see is simply sourcing without knowing the source. Um, in essence, the ones where we find good quality products without naming anyone, they have a very good understanding of the production. Some of them produce it themselves, and that has been criticized for basically not giving enough opportunities to local um, farmers because it's on one big farm. If it's a, a mass product um, controlled, others are really investing a lot of time and effort in um, small holders and supporting them in their agricultural practice. Others um, have invested in very specific systems to a certain quality control. So I think it's really um, my big call to the sector is understand what you what's happening before and these um famous cases and i could um, name many where basically um people at the end of the value chain have said well yeah we just buy it but i don't really know where it comes from and i said well is it from india or from pakistan or from bangladesh well i don't know we got it from a um, supplier um somewhere in god knows where and um this is exactly i think part of the problem. And that again brings in all sorts of other challenges because, okay, from the consumer perspective, the problem is that I get something which may be a poor quality. From a um, conservation perspective, it may actually be something which is simply the wrong product, not on purpose adulterated, but um, simply poor quality. That's why also the whole discussion um, is so difficult in terms of what's going wrong here. What's going wrong here is not necessarily that a certain company or person or group of people are doing something wrong, but that they, 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 in the most simplest way, don't know what they are exactly doing and what practice they should follow. That again links you back into um, the primary producers and their need to really um, understand what they have to do from an international standard, but also what they have to do from the perspective of the local needs. Can you say a bit more when you say from the perspective of the local needs? Well, that's um, you know, what I just said. Um, what is the best way um, to produce things? So to give you a little okay. interesting little example, and I don't know how good or bad it is. Some years ago, I when we had the um, St. John's Road project, I went to um, observe some um, production systems for St. John's Word in China. 
and they did some intercropping between potatoes and St. John's wort. But never ever seen it in my life before. And I cannot comment on how good or bad this is from the perspective of quality control. But I thought it was brilliant. From a soil perspective, sort of made sense to, sense to me. It's sort of a more sandy soil, not very, very nutrient rich necessarily, not too low me, but maybe a little bit. But the it's a simple idea to in this innovation seemed to me something really exciting. So this was trying to um, solve some local needs with some sort of intercropping. And I'm not here to um, judge it for it being positive or negative, but I'm judging it as a, a brilliant idea. And that's happening everywhere. But then we need to see, does it make sense? I was in another um, project in another, um, involved in another project where the argument actually was, we know that a certain plant can de decontaminate the soil and we have a high level of heavy metals. So can we use these plants to decontaminate the, the soil and then sell it? Now that's a local need, which clearly clashes with the international standards. And I got myself into serious trouble with the um, colleagues where I said, this is unethical because um, you simply cannot do it, but it doesn't do any harm. You will not see it in a tea. I said, that's not really the point. You cannot have high levels of cadmium and strontium in um, a, a, a finished herbal product um, if you want to be um, a good producer. So I think these are the type of discussions we need to have. And again, it's not about a right or wrong answer. It's just finding a way to develop best practice. Tony, were you going to jump in and add something before when I... No, no, I think that's, um, we covered that. Yeah, um, and so there's some questions in the chat that I wanna to get to, um, but I wanna ask, so what, what does this work, what have you learned from it for research? What, what is, like, has it shaped the questions you're asking now or what are your take home messages from the research? For me, one of the key changes has been, and that's, has been ongoing before is the sort of dynamic. I'm coming out of a system where I was dealing with traditional medicine. And it always had this sort of um, element of an isolated static. I have a poster here from um, Cultural Survival, um, Preserving Culture. And you see it in a um, little container, basically conserved um, like a marmalade or a jam. And so I'm, I'm somewhat coming from a tradition where these things were very much intrinsic, mm -hmm. this sort of traditional knowledge system, which is a very valuable element. I'm not saying that traditional knowledge is not very important, but I think we need to understand these cross-cultural dynamics. We need to understand this dialogue between cultures. And that's a lot of our more recent projects are focusing on exactly this. We have a project in Guatemala where we are trying to build up partnerships so that uh, we can develop beneficial outcomes for both sides. But the simple fact is I cannot talk about um, traditional medicine as something static. And the other thing is um, that many of the ways we interpret it um, simply, we need to really step out of our own thinking and see the other side. How would I look at this from a whatever other perspective? So they sort of um, getting yourself out of your own brain into um, someone else's and trying to see the complexity is another important thing which um, this has fostered very much. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and for me, but, um, I think because I've also got a very strong interest in the in the clinical side, um, what stood out from uh, for me apart from the quality is. Um, um, linked in with the, the NMR metabolomic studies that, that, that we did. So even if we take um, plants that we'd regard of good, good quality, um, in whatever definition we make for the good quality, there's still an extreme uh, variation in chemical composition. So it, ju it just really uh, brought home to me, whenever you do a clinical trial on a herb, um, if you ever try to repeat that trial, the likelihood of you using something with the same uh, chemical composition is actually quite low. 
um, unless you've done some good metabolomic studies before. And what we found by doing these studies, perhaps take you know, 60, 100 different samples and, and look at the, in detail at their chemical composition, what you can say then is, okay, this is a representative sample of the species. So perhaps in the future, when we, when we start to do more uh, clinical human intervention type studies, we can say that this, uh, what we've, what we've um, used as our, as our tre treatment is either a representative of the species, or if it is an outlier, it, if it, it, may, it might be something that's very different uh, chemically to a typical uh, plant, but it, at least we know that. Whereas I think before uh, a lot of trials have been done just on this plant, it's been identified, deposited in a herbarium, and then the, the trial's gone ahead and then perhaps it's been repeated at some time in the future and the results are very different. I think looking at the metabolomic studies, that, you know, they really explain or help to explain what, why, that, why that may happen. Yeah, I mean, it was fascinating just reading the, the studies themselves that aren't going that far and to bring that level of specificity and feedback, right, that, um, that is, I don't often see, that, to kind of build on the point you are making, Michael, about the cross-cultural dynamic. I want to, Stefan has a question here. Um, I'll just read it. I've seen it. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Well, I'll read it so that people. Yeah, yeah, for the audience. Yeah. Since you are an ethopharmacologist at heart, what can we learn from traditional healers with regard to plant harvesting and processing? Are there any lessons for the herbal medicine manufacturers, or is the scale just too different? Very good question, Stefan, and a very challenging one. I think the main question is how different are the scales? Because um, in fact, what we are talking about here is not different in many of the um, sort of traditional um, trade networks, which we find um, globally. In fact, it's quite interesting. The, the first value chain study I ever did was a part of um, my postdoctoral period in Freiburg in Germany. And we looked at something very simple. We looked at chamomile quality throughout Mexico. And the finding was um, very straightforward. Material which we sourced from the central market in Mexico City, the Ciudad de Mexico, the so-called Mercado de Sonora, was good um, quality and did comply with pharmacopoeial standards. And then we got materials, the further away you got from the city, the poorer the quality was. And in the end, in the community where I worked, the material which arrived were basically stalks of chamomile without flower heads and without any essential oil. So I think um, what we can learn um, in, in this context is that many of the economic mechanisms are the same. And it's again about financial um, enabling, financial empowerment of um, communities in this case and about some sort of a framework which, yes, guarantees decent quality standards for what's being used and what's um, used with um, some sort of a medicinal claim. The other thing which I think um, we can simply um, learn is a certain openness. I always found traditional and local healers very open to a discussion and interested in learning. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case with both academics and stakeholders in the industry. So the willingness uh, to engage with um, somebody who is able and willing and able to explain the things um, was tremendous. And I have learned a lot from the questions I got in the field. Yeah, <clears throat> I think you know, being someone who's, who's, who's um mainly done their clinical training in Chinese herbal medicine. I think uh, traditional knowledge is, is, is very important, especially when it comes to uh, secondary processing of herbs. And most of this knowledge um, is recorded in, in texts that are up to you know, 2,000 years old and you know, in 200 uh, current era in the Han Dynasty in China, there's still some of the main texts that are still relevant uh, today for looking at even things like how viruses enter the body and, and move through different levels of the body and consequently how different herbs 
may be used at, at the different stages. So I think um, uh, traditional knowledge used in this way is vitally important than going over to any kind of um, biochemical uh, medicinal model is actually is actually quite a big mistake, and I think the, the the results are likely to be a lot less if if the traditional knowledge is is disregarded. There was a comment in the chat which is sort of linked to this. So this was a criticism that we should not that we need clear quality standards which are chemistry based. And I think that's a very good point. I fully agree with it. Unfortunately, I lost the um, um, the, the message. The point is a galenolactic taste and smell properties were very important 30, 40, 50 years ago in pharmacopoeias and in other systems. And yes, this is not what we are doing today. But at the same time, we also need to think about systems which enable a simple assessment of quality locally. It's, it brings us back to the question of where do we do all these assessments? So we need something really simple which can be done at the local level. And that can simply be a photograph with a mobile phone or a cell phone in American English um, to document the, the plant, the species, uh, the plant parts used, to document the finished dry truck, drug. And then this is analyzed in a small, simple chemical lab somewhere. So I think you need to be more creative. And that's where the most recent project we have, which is very early stage, on blockchain technologies come in, because what we also need is traceability. We need to document these, this information throughout the entire value chain. Mm. So again, it's about integrating and connecting these different um, yeah, um, knowledge systems. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. And um, certainly with my sort of chemist head on, you know, the, the chemical part is very important. Uh, but also, um, because there are, there's lots of questions about how do we measure quality, and what, what I've actually kind of moved into now is, is looking more at actually the, the biological quality and the latest projects we're doing at the University of Westminster, and we've got PhD students working on this, is um, uh, using mitochondria as a measure of um, quality and how a herb or even a herbal formula uh, can affect uh, mitochondrial activity and mitochondrial health. And you know, we've, we've had one paper out um, about this already, and I think it might kind of um, uh, really change the way that we look at quality and actually be more attractive to people that are more on the clinical side. So I think certainly we need to get the chemical side and the, and the quality um, sorted out, but it really doesn't give us so much information about the effectiveness and what might be called the, the um, uh, potency of either individual herbs or herbal medicines, because we know some active ingredients, but we don't really know what they are for, for many herbs, particularly the Chinese ones. And I think just being able to measure how a herb um, affects mitochondrial health, either in an in vitro model or um, equally in, in, a, in a human body is going to be really important in the future. It's fascinating. It makes me think, as you're both talking, you know, the incredible complexity and diversity of the plants and then the interaction with in a local community with the soils and the cultures, and then an industry that requires a level of standardization and sameness. And, you know, it's like putting a square in a circle or, you know, and so I'm curious about, you know, if you all have any thoughts or reflections on that, they're two different things. Well, they are different things. You know, I think in the end, we need to accept whatever the square and the circle is, but we need to accept that the industry needs certain um, standard operating procedures. Otherwise it simply doesn't function. So I think we do need to acknowledge that in the end, whatever we are doing, it has to comply with certain quality standards and obviously um, lots of people have rightfully complained about this not being uh, the right standard, it being um, poorly um, translatable into patient benefits. But in the end, I think it's something where we need to have these standards. Otherwise, we just open the door to everyone doing and claiming that this is a standard. 
So unfortunately, I think it's a requirement we, we need to live with. But it brings us um, again to this whole issue of, I think we need to go get away from this idea of um, a medicinal plant just being the active without any um, further characterization. Um, Werner Knoes famously always says, there are no herbal generics, talking about industrial products, uh, finished products. And I think um, you can also put it in the botanical term. It is about understanding this diversity and making sure that what you have is something which is comparable in chemical and in biological terms and biological meaning in terms of biological activity in this case. Mm -hmm. Tony, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I don't think so. There's a question, Rocio Alacron, that kind of follows on that. She wondered, I'll read it. Um, how I wonder, like Michael said, the traditional medicine is dynamic. In Ecuador, there are turmeric, big movement in the local mar markets. Information has arrived from the outside the country. How would we apply a simple model for quality control for herbals that are introduced and changed in terms of management by the local culture and the changing uses? Now, um, Ecuador, obviously, um, I think the, the starting point would be that you will need to, if you want to export the material, you need to uh, comply with whatever is required by the relevant, um, let's say, importing countries or regions. Um, in the end, um, the requirements for Ecuador are not different um, from India or um, any other country. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's an introduced plant or not. Some of these plants have been introduced for centuries and they are part of the cultures, other or more recent arrivals. So I don't think in chemical terms, it makes any difference where the plant is from or where it's grown. But what makes the difference really is what um, is the purpose um, for using them? How are these plants then actually um, used um, commercially? And um, there may be differences because of the growing conditions. Don't get me wrong. It may be that specific growing conditions change the chemistry and that may be beneficial or not. And that's um, something which needs to be looked at very specifically. But um, fundamentally, um, it doesn't make any um, specific um, difference. What makes a difference is, again, the knowledge and the understanding of the production and the processing. Mm -hmm. And hello, Rocio, by the way. Good to have you on chat. Um, and also, um, Marcus Blumenthal was quite happy about it. There's a question. Tony, did you want to add any or was that? Yeah, not, uh, no, no, just it kind of just emphasizes as well that, you know, the difference in variability between, you know, different chemotypes and, you know, the whole issue of wild collection versus cultivation and, you know, how you, where herbs are grown will affect their uh, secondary metabolites, you know, if, if plants have to protect, them, protect themselves against predation, they're, they're, they're going to develop uh, secondary metabolites that you probably wouldn't find if something's grown, you know, in a greenhouse or in a, in a well-controlled field. So it's, it's an interesting area. Well, and try to, so to follow up on that in a slightly different way, there's a question and just for people who have a question, please enter them in the Q&A. I can't really follow the chat. But this is a question about the soils and the variation of the soils. Um, wondering if the general quality of soil and different adverse environmental conditions per broad or micro region in India or other areas in the world has been mapped um, for those interested in sourcing botanicals. And well, it has been mapped, yes, um, but you can't really use it because that would require that you have exact information where the material is from. And even if it's mapped, it may be that it comes from a, um, an area which is contaminated or not. So I think it's, um, it's very difficult to use mapping in this context to ascertain that it's um, free of heavy metals or below a certain concentration. And again, I think in the end, what gets lost in the value chain is simply um, the exact sourcing. The other thing we shouldn't forget is the bigger um, a value chain gets, the more it's inter different materials are intermingled. 
one of the later studies Tony did are very interesting because I think we are showing there that rhodiola products are in many cases a mixture of two close related species, but they're still chemically different. And this happens somewhere high in the Himalayan mountains or later down once the material is brought down. So we have two species of rhodiola, rosea and crenolata, and they are mixed and they're very good reasons why this happens, but they're also very bad ones. So the challenge here is again, that what's being collected at the beginning is not what you get afterwards um, along the value chain because a value chain by definition is composed of people combining and then separating different batches. And so one, an, another question that I'm always asked also as a consumer in Canada, how do I know, find or know if a her herbal supplement is of high quality? But this is a broader question of the implications of the research you've done for consumers. What action would you hope we would take with it as well as how would we find products that are going to do what they say they're going to do? I would say in Europe, the best question is look for regulated products in the sense of being regulated as a medicine. In Canada, the regulatory system is relatively straightforward, simple, which is good. So um, I would certainly argue that you should follow um, products um, which have any form of um, regulatory approval. This doesn't take away local initiatives where something is produced locally. But then the big difference is that you know everyone from the producer to the vendor. You take the example of honey, um, a very straightforward one. Many of the um, international value chains today are huge. And what you get is in many cases, not honey, but basically um, crystallized sugar mixed with a um, few other things. Um, but if you can rely on local producers, it may be good quality. But then these local producers may not be able to check for the contamination with perlicidine alkaloids, which must happen in the international chains. So unfortunately, there's no straightforward and 100% certain answer to this. <clears throat> no, it's, uh, it, it's a difficult one. Um... As Michael said, if something's been, I mean, in, in, in the UK and Europe, we have got the tradi traditional herbal uh, registration where um, um, herbal medicines are, have to be the same safety or they're subject to the same regulations and testing as, as, as pharmaceuticals and they're it's controlled by the, um, the relevant government. Uh, so equivalent to the FDA in, in the UK, the MHRA. But for the majority of food supplements that are out there, it's it's much more com complex. Um, I mean, what one one measure that pe people may use is um, if something has organic um, certification. So although it won't guarantee um, a lot many quality um, measures, it will it will show that the the, the plant or a, a company has been subject to some kind of external auditing and they've had to put in quite a lot of effort um, in many stages of the, the supply chain in order to get that um, organic certification. So um, you could say organic certification is one, one measure of, of, of quality. So we're actually coming to the end of the hour. There's, so there are a few more questions. I'm sorry, we won't have a chance to get to them because I wanted to ask one. So this we're can get very technical, but ultimately it's about plants and people. And I wanted to hear from each of you about what to you really matters most, what, what, what feels most important about the, the work you're doing with plants and people. If I, if I, if I kick off um, first, I mean, I think for me that's, that's changed. Um, uh, quite a lot because originally, as I said, I, I just come from a, a chemistry background where you know my main interest was the the different levels of adulterants and contaminants in herbal medicines. Um, but now, since you know post PhD and, and in my current research, I'm much more interested in one uh, the clinical side of of using herbal medicines and their actual uh, biological potency. 
um, using things like mitochondria as a as a model to measure this as one model, but also the 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 effects that um, it has on people's livelihoods and and, and well being and the econ world economies as, um, or local economies around the world because it it, it seems you know it, it, if people are actually becoming worse off or suffering in order to produce a product a product that is actually um, that may help someone in a in a far off country and usually a much more developed country that that, that seems um, an, an imbalance to me and this is something you know during my PhD that, I, that, that, that was very evident with, with the whole tea trade and how companies would would drive down the price especially in supermarkets in in, in the United Kingdom uh, how they drive down the price of tea until the actual farmers themselves would would be um, realizing less than one percent of the value of that tea and um, this is where we need more things like the fair trade initiative fair wild initiative um, which is a good initiative but it only represents um, uh, about one percent of, of trade so we just need more of fair wild fair trade more things looking at sustainability and more things looking at how um, what we do in more developed, economically developed countries affect people in less economically developed countries and find a way of working together so we can provide better governance for, for that supply chain all, all the way along. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Now from, from my side, um, I, I would actually come with a um, slightly different perspective and I fully agree with Tony um, in terms of also looking more at the biological um, quality control measures, um, which are, I think are very exciting opportunity. That, but my key word is actually um, cross-cultural and, and transdisciplinary communication and understanding. So I think what we need is um, to break up um, this thinking that analytical tools can solve the problem as such the, all these things only work if we translate it in some sort of a dialogue and if all parties have a mutual understanding what the basic principles are. I don't need to know the details of Tony's mitochondrial assay, but I need to understand how it works and what it can do and what can it not do. I don't need to understand how turmeric is grown in India, but I need to understand what the key problems are these farmers are facing and what the key opportunities are. So I think it's really about this very wide ranging interdisciplinarity, but also cross-cultural thinking and understanding different perspectives, while at the same time recognizing that we are living in a world which is regulated by a certain framework, a certain, I hope um, in the end, um, the um, homo sociologicus, the social human, um, where we need to form some sort of a community agreeing on what is um, an adequate practice. And one of the recent examples I'm, we are doing here is a push for best practice in the phytochemical characterization of extracts used pharmacologically. So it's trying to bring stakeholders together and to come to some sort of a minimal agreement what works. And um, so it's getting beyond the direct technical side into something more communication and outreach oriented. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's so much here and around the, the positive benefits of this cross fertilization of ideas and research and different methodologies and different practices and the value of seeing those different practices and the importance. And Tony, your point again, that products that are for our wellness, they should be creating wellness all along the, all from the, all the way from the source. Thank you both so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your research. And thank everyone for joining for this webinar. And I'm just going to share this one screen. If Tony, if Tony or Michael, if you want to say anything while I. Do no, this. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. Good, good to be here. So thank everyone. Um, and again, we'll share the recording of this webinar as well as information on our upcoming one on December 2nd. So thank you all for joining.
Ufuk kapitali kapalı. 